And we are live on the air. Okay, so um, give it just a second. I want to uh, let this thing spool up for a minute because I've noticed that when I when I wait just a few minutes, the show tends to buffer a little bit better for everybody, and um, then I can have all the viewers be happy. Uh, so this is the Synth Summit Show, episode 18. And uh, we have John Bowen on the show uh, of John Bowen Synth Designs. Uh, John is a, uh, you, you've been in the industry for just a little over a short t period of time. You've <laughs> been you've been involved in, in quite a few projects and in uh, a lot of different products that, that people hold in pretty high regard. So um, what I wanted to do before we dive too much into, um, you know, the, the current crop of synthesizers that you've been involved in and, and what you're doing these days, I want to kind of get a history on uh, how you got into the industry and uh, why you got in, into the industry at all to begin with. And um, then we can start diving into products that you've been involved with and that sort of thing. I'm, I'm the host. I probably should mention that. I am Flux, uh, Ken Flux Pierce. I'm a sound designer, um, music technology consult, you know, that kind of stuff. So most people know me uh, from this show on previous episodes. If you want to get in touch with me, you can certainly use the live chat feature that's uh, on YouTube. It's very helpful if you just comment in the live chat. And if you have any questions or anything, there's going to be a lot of really interesting topics that come up. Feel free to ask questions on there, and we will pop right in there. I see Div, Div Kids in there right now. So, uh, John, tell us how you got into the uh, trade here and uh, where you got your start. Okay. Uh, first, I want to say thanks for uh, asking me to do this. It's a real honor and pleasure to be able to talk to everyone. So uh, I always loved sound, um, and we didn't have synthesizers back in the day, right? So, <laughs> but uh, just fascinated with sound. Would take tapes and turn them upside down and play them backwards and manipulate sound that way as best I could, you know, just for fun. And uh, went to University of California at Berkeley, and in the uh, spring of seventy two, nineteen seventy two, they got a Moog. Uh, model 55 there. So they brought all of us who were taking music history uh, downstairs to see it. And it was, they let us in the door and it was at the other end of the room and we, we weren't allowed to get close to it. <laughs> it's like, this is for graduate students only. You guys can't touch it, but you can come in. We're like 20 feet away from it to look at. Just, <laughs> you can <yeah>. smell it. <laughs> I was fascinated. I said, wow, I've, you know, and then starting to hear things when uh, Carlos comes out with Switch on Box. So you started getting aware of this thing. And um, I'd go over to occasionally there, there were some music uh, concerts over at Mills College. They had a bootless system there. And I think it actually might have been a surge and bootless system. And they had a bunch of other stuff. They had an old uh, Chamberlain there, <clears throat> which is a precursor mm -hmm. to Mellotron. Anyway, so I remember specifically going over there to listen to a, an uh, experimental music thing. And it was a very large hall. <clears throat> so the acoustics were fantastic, and natural reverb. And they just started out with this droning oscillators, you know, just a couple oscillators, low, very low and droned and just filled the air. And I was, I was hooked, you know, I was mesmerized. <laughs> and so I started to explore what I could find out about them. And uh, <clears throat> I was in a band then. I've always been in a band, it seems. And we had a gig up in... Uh, now, you were playing bass, right? I am playing bass. Okay. And uh, still am. And uh, um, I'm from California originally, but I'm up in Seattle now. So we had a gig, and it was up here in the Seattle area. And uh, <clears throat> I found a music store up here near the airport. I was, we were staying, playing in Kent for like five weeks. We had a long gig. And uh, anyway, I found this music store. They had an ARP 2600. Uh, they were advertising. So I went over there. I must have seen it in, you know, didn't have internet, didn't have Facebook or anything. I must have seen it in uh, a newspaper or something. Anyway, I found out that they had an ARP 2600 and I went over to the store and uh, I said, I, you got one of these synthesizer things here? 
And the guy pointed to a room that had a glass window, and it, but it was soundproof. And he said, yeah, it's in there. And you, I said, can I go, you know, can I touch it? Because I still wanted to get close to these. And he said, yeah, just go in there and knock yourself out. So I went in there and, ah, at last. <laughs> one of these things could not make a single sound i was so frustrated so after about 10 minutes i exited the room went up to the counter and i said do you have an owner's manual for this he said yeah i said i'll buy it you know, can i buy it from you and i think he charged me like five bucks for the manual not thinking anybody else was going to need a manual when they came in and bought the thing i, I don't know and i took that back with me and every night after the gig you know, we'd play, usually play nine to quarter to two in those days. And then uh, get back to where we were staying. And I, I took the manual out and I would read and I make notes on the, on the, uh, on a separate page and read and read. And then after a couple of nights, the next day I went back, saw the guy, Hey, uh, can I go try this time? I went in there and Voila, I got it to sound. I was so happy. <laughs> I got it. But that first art manual, that 2600 manual, that was it was a phenomenal beginner's course, I think. I just I just loved it. Um, very easy to understand because I wasn't uh, I don't have an engineering background. I was just playing music. And a uh, really good way to start out. So, after that gig was done, came back to California, grabbed a really good friend of mine whose opinion I um, totally respected always in everything. He had great musical taste and so on and so forth. The guitar player I worked with. And we went down to San Francisco. We were in Vallejo at the time. We went down to San Francisco and we went to the big music store there, Don Weir's Music City. And I said, do you guys have this ARP 2600? I want to show it to my friend. He said, no, we've got this other thing. It's called a mini mode. Oh, okay. So I went up and, uh, we plugged that in, kind of looked at it. Well, it doesn't have the sliders, and you know, it's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. But oh, there's, there's an oscillator. Okay, there's you know, there's some of the basics, and you know, it did play. You didn't have to do much to make it play, unlike the twenty six hundred. And I said, okay, well, that, that's interesting. Uh, let's go to this other store I know of, and we'll we'll find that twenty six hundred. So we did. We found another store with a twenty six hundred, and I I wanted to show off all of my new knowledge to my buddy, right? So I took him through, look what you can do with this and this. And then when we left the store, he goes, you know, that that other one, that the uh, the first one, the mini thing, it sounded different. And I said, no, it should, it should be the same. It's just an oscillator and, and a filter. It's gotta be all the same circuitry, right? <laughs> he says, no, it sounded different to me. So we went back. Can we play on the mini mode again? Yes. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure enough, it has, no oh, darn, it, I actually like the sound better. <laughs> and I really wanted to get a 2600, but <laughs> shoot, this one had more balls to it or something. Anyway, so that's like the summer of 72. Um, and I found a place to rent a mini mug. It was a Beaver and Kraus, Paul Beaver and Bernie Kraus. They had a studio. Um, so I got to rent a mini mug for a weekend for 50 bucks. And uh, we put together a trio. This fella that I brought with me, a guitarist, and a, he played bass for the trio. I did the Keith Emerson thing. I brought uh, a B3, I borrowed a B3 from another guy, and I brought a smaller organ. So I had those two keyboards, I had the mini mug, and we learned Tarkus, um, you know, basically just did that just for fun. Rented a hall, put the gig on ourselves, and it, it was so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the people thought of it, but uh, I just, you know, all the mini mug settings. You, just, you have a piece of paper, kind of, you know, look at it, switch it as fast as you could. But after that, and I recorded that. And after that, I really was like... Now, do you still have that recording? No. Have you lost it? <laughs> I might. There's probably cassettes somewhere. But anyway, I was just totally now, I had to get involved with synthesizers somehow. So right after that, there was a show at the Cow Palace in San Francisco 
which is a, a large venue for all kinds of fairs and things. And they had a music expo, kind of like a NAMM show, but it was open to the public. This was like October 72. And the only synthesizer that was there was uh, Electrocomp, uh, EML. I think there's an EML 101 that was out that you might know of. Anyway, and Norman Millard was the guy there, and I approached him and I said, is there any way I can represent you or work with you on the West Coast and da 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 and I can do this? And he goes, well, we don't really have any sales yet. We don't have any sales department. And, uh, nothing we can really do. We're just kind of getting going, you know. But I really, I thought they had a pretty nice product. It's, uh, if you've ever seen it, it's like a mini cabinet thing. And uh, it had cables. And it was pretty nice. And then uh, after that, I'm sorry to make this so long. Um, no, 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 that's fine. I did a, uh, I backed up this singer in a folk lounge for uh, like a, it was like a Sunday night or something. We just went in and played a little bit. And they said, hey, you like synthesizers, right? <laughs> um, there was this guy here who said he was from Moog, but he came in and played his banjo. And I try to connect banjo and synthesizers, right? Really? And his name was Doc Botanic, and he worked. Oh, did we lose something? Huh? No, I was tossing oh, up hey, an electric comp. Yeah. I'm over here working. <laughs> there, is it. there it is. So, uh, anyway, um, I was also working at a music store, and I heard about this guy, Doc Botanic, banjo player, works for Mo, West Coast. Hmm, this sounds like a great connection, right? And the music store, through the music store, I got in to go to the first, my first NAMM show, which which was, this would have been like uh, March of 73 now, 1973. And what what they did then, so usually the NAMM shows back then were in June in Chicago every year. And it was a spinoff of the Consumer Electronics Show way back in the, in the 50s. In the good old days. And they used to be just band instruments, but then keyboards and you know then I expanded so that they split away but anyway uh, June Chicago was the big big damn show but some of the West Coast dealers apparently were complaining too much that they had always traveled there so three months before the June show in March they did a spring NAM show and they did it two years in San Francisco 72 and 73 I think it was and so I went there I got in because I worked at the music store I went right to the Moog booth. I found Doc Bocenic, introduced myself, said, I heard you played in this club, blah, blah, blah. And I said, how did you get involved? And he turned around and he pointed to this guy. He says, you need to talk to Dave Van Covering. He's our sales manager, and he'll he'll tell you all about it. And I was like, fantastic. So I went over there and introduced myself. And I don't know if you know who Dave Van Covering is, but um, would be maybe you know the Vaco Orchestron. So that's that's his thing, but he he was the most charismatic individual, and I guess it's because his I think his dad was a, a minister, and I think he might have been too. Anyway, he had this great presentation. He put his hands out towards you. You could be our next, uh, you know, uh, salesperson for Moog. I mean, he he was quite quite uh, persuasive and everything. So. I told him what I would love to work for Moog somehow and blah, 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 blah. And he said, well, send me, send me something, send me a cassette of anything you've got. I said, I've got just a thing we did. I rented me Moog, we did Tarkus, I got that recorded. And he said, send it to me and we'll see what we can do. So I, I, did, I didn't have much of a resume, been in a band, blah, 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 blah. But I sent in the tape in like uh, April. And then in May, uh, he told me to fly back uh, they were going to bring me back to Chicago, uh, sorry, to Williamsville, this was, where Moog was at the time outside of Buffalo. So I got to fly back there, and when I got there, uh, Van Covering was gone. <laughs> I was like, I didn't know any, I, there was nobody there I knew. And uh, what they wanted to do was they wanted to try out a bunch, uh, a, a number of us, or actually, well, anyway, a guy named Tom Lamb met me there picked me up to the airport and proceeded to take me to the facility and went through everything. And make a long story shorter here, 
uh, they had me go to the Chicago June NAM show as a as a tryout, I guess. And um, they sent me up with a mini Moog or a little podium with headphones all the way around it, and I would just instruct people what uh, what the mini of them, you know, how it works, when it does, blah blah blah. And then at the end of that show, I had two tickets. I had one ticket to take me back to California, and one ticket to take me back to Williamsville to Buffalo, New York. And I didn't know what I was going to do, and I had like four hours to decide, you know, one way or the other. So uh, a fellow named Dave Luce had been hired recently to develop uh, polyphonic Moogs. Uh, he went around to each person in the room, and it was a fairly large room, and I could see you know, him one to, one to the next to the next. And he came over to me and says, I'm very happy to offer you our first official clinician position at Moog Music. So that was it. That's how I got started back in 1973. And that was doing, uh, so from that point f forward for a while, you were going out giving clinics and teaching yeah. people how to use the Moog? Right. I was on the West Coast as the West Coast specialist to help the salespeople. And, and so... Now, were you making a lot of studio visits during that time? And um... No, just music stores. And, uh, you know, Dave uh, Van Covering had gone through this, the dealers. You, you'll probably read this. You can read this about him in many other states. <laughs> but he just went through and he sold all these stores a, a mini mode. And they, they had the thing in there, but they didn't know what to do with it. So that was my job was to go out and, you know, help help them understand what it was. So. Um, that went on for a couple of years and then, and, the, there's some minor details in there. It was on again, off again, because, uh, Moog was sold at that time mm -hmm. to Norland Industries. And I didn't know that was happening. And actually they, when I went back after they hired me, I was back on the West coast doing a few things. And I went back to, to work with Bob Moog to prepare for this Japanese a music show in the end of September it was in '73, and then we found out that they were selling the company, and uh, they wanted Bob to wear a, a tuxedo for this presentation in Japan in Tokyo that we did, and so he he played on a minimo or uh, we had a big modular system, so he played the lead lines to a couple of songs, and then I did the backing track basically, right? So I had a mini mode for a bass line and then I had a sonic six which was just duophonic so I had the bass the root and you know the third and the fifth so I could play basic chords and then uh Norland gave us a maestro drum machine with us and I put a stop start pedal on it because sometimes uh, Bob would not play <laughs> exactly in time so I'd have to stop and start the machine quickly so anyway we learned a couple of songs he liked hey Jude he liked Bitch by the Rolling Stones and uh, one other one. Oh, and Popcorn, which was a famous, you know, something synth song back then. So we did those three songs. And uh, he really hated the idea of one of wearing a tuxedo. So he went out and he bought this purple, pinkish, this was just really garish looking tuxedo, just kind of despite, I think, nor other than way. Anyway, so. We did presentations there. When I came back from from that, they said, well, we're letting go. You know, we sold to Norland. Norland's got all of his sales people, and we're not going to have anybody in this in the Moog sales department. So at that time, I went back to California, uh, was contacted by these guys, Nielsen and Pearson, who's the band that I focused most on. And uh, then I got a call from Norland a year later and they said, well, none of the salespeople know how what to do with this stuff. Can you come back and work? So I had a year there where I was working just with the Nielsen Pierce Band in 74, and then in 75, I started back with them. So uh, I'm out doing these presentations and finding that, you know, two hands, it's just not enough if you want interesting musical material going on. We had a, a Moog sample and hold that provided a kind of a rhythmic, you know, background set it up running on a filter or something. And I did a little bit of product design for them also at, at that point. I was giving feedback on the uh, expanded micro mode, which was the multi mode, I think, eventually. And I also was playing around with this poly mode thing. And maybe you've seen Moog had a thing called a constellation 
series yeah. and the Taurus mm -hmm. pedals, the Apollo polyphonic and the uh, Lyra or Lyra was mm -hmm. the monophonic top one. And that had an aftertouch keyboard. And that whole unit went out with Keith Emerson with ELP for, for a while. But um, got to play on that at first and give some feedback. Dave Luce did the Apollo part of it, which uh, eventually that became a poly mode. But the original Apollo was really more synthesizer control, a much wider frequency range uh, for modulation. It was really fun to play. And they really scaled it way back for the for Apollo, for the uh, poly mode, I think, partially because of marketing interests. They, wanted it to be less, I don't know, flexible anyway. Um, and Dave Luce, by the way, he just passed away, uh, unfortunately, recently, but he got hired on the basis of this this tape that he, um, these instruments he did that were so realistic sounding and they're all synthesized. I mean, sampling really wasn't happening yet. And he played me this tape and, and uh, I was just, I, I was amazed. I think I still have that cassette somewhere, actually. I was just amazed how accurate he did his, you know, his stuff. And he was doing resonant filter banks and so on. So really respected Dave a lot. And uh, sorry to read that he, he just passed away. Anyway, so I'm doing these presentations, but I wanted to add to it complexity of things and I couldn't uh, the only sequencer the Moog had you know was the big modular sequencer so uh, I didn't have a modular system um, all of us who worked there had an account of uh, had instruments provided to us so I had too many Moogs on my account I had this white uh, organ thing that they wanted us to use I don't even remember the name of that but it had a Moog made a little thing I think it was called the minute Moog you talk about like the 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 white elephant was I think the nickname of it, and it was yeah. like a, it was an organ and a yeah. and a moog together. Yeah, yeah, I, I've played on one of those a few times, and it, it was not the um, wasn't the best. <laughs> no, I had to drag drag that thing around anyway. And then I had a I got a Freeman string machine somehow. They they were providing us with that, and so anyway, and they had hired Roger Powell. Uh, and he ordered a huge modular system that at the time was, well, I think it was about $25,000 worth of stuff, but this is, you know, 75, 70. Yeah. So anyway, so they said, well, we, we got too much money out there on the account. You can't have a modular system. So, okay. Um, so I got keyboard magazine and I looked in there and I was living down in Oakland at the time. And I said, well, there's two companies that are making sequencers advertising here. One of them is called Emu, and the other one is the Sequential Circuits. And I thought, I'm going to approach these guys and see if I can swing a deal where I can get one of their sequencers, right? Sure. So, it's kind of funny, but when you asked me, you know, why I was interested in how I got started, we're musicians and we want to have more toys to play with, basically. Right? <laughs> story of my life my motivation early on in, in a lot of it was just to have you know some some more things to play with so um to get your hands on gear you can approach afford. these guys <laughs> and they weren't too far away they were down in san jose i was in oakland it's 40 minute drive and i called the emu phone number and i said yes this is john bowen with mode music and i would uh, very much like to come visit your factory and uh, you know talk to you about some things and uh, Whoever it was, it answered. Said, "Well, we don't have a factory. We just have a two-bedroom apartment. Uh, but you're welcome to come by." <laughs> oh, okay. So uh, Dave Rossum and Scott Wedge were living at this apartment, and when I got there, they had a coffee table and a huge emu modular system, and everything else that there was nothing else in their apartment. <laughs> so they uh, took me through their system, and it's a great system. And that sounded fantastic, and but their sequencer was built into the keyboard, and I could I could quickly see it wasn't going to work for me because I needed something, you know, portable that I could run the Moog stuff with. So I thanked them for their time, and and then I said, "Do you know anything about this sequential circuits guy?" And they said, "Well, we provide the clock module that he 
he uses to run his sequencer, but he's, you know, he's not really doing much other than that little box. And they kind of gave me the feeling like, yeah, he wasn't anybody to really go see. Anyway, so I got out, got to a phone and I called the sequential circuits number right after this. Hi, Jabo Ramo, blah, 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 blah. And uh, the woman who answered, well, there's no factory, just a two bedroom apartment. <laughs> and Dave's not here right now, he's, he's still at work. <laughs> but if you, you know, want to come by, sure. So I had, I don't know, it delayed some time, went over there, knocked on the door. He wasn't there yet, went back and sat in my car, waited till 5.30 or whatever it was, and went back up and, and knocked on the door and introduced myself to Dave, and he had me come in and showed me his little uh, Model 700, I think it is, sequencer. And he played bass, I played bass. I introduced him, you know, to the band I was in, because that was still a big focus. And in fact, we played in, in San Jose a couple of times, and Dave came out to see us, and he, he saw that I was a legitimate, you know, claim that we were playing and all that but um we kind of you know immediately kind of hit it off who was the, the better bass player what's that i said who was the better bass player <laughs> well oh. they <laughs> wasn't, wasn't playing professionally so but um i'm always we, trying to stir up something in the industry yeah, we just we got along you know and <laughs> had the same interests and uh i said well this, this seems great. He'd only sold a couple of them. Um, one of them to Len Sasso, who's done some uh, uh, magazines and, and owner's guides and things. And one to San Francisco State. Anyway, I made this proposition. I said, you give me one of these sequencers and I'll take it around and I'll promote it at all of my mode gigs on the side, right? And I didn't know if that was how that was going to float with Norlin, but I tried to be you know, they didn't have a competing product to it. So anyway, that's how I met Dave and we got started with that whole thing. Now with Dave, that you got to work on the polymod feature on the Profit 5? So, yeah, so here's the thing. We're in Nielsen Pearson Band. I'm in Nielsen Pearson Band. And we're working on getting our record deal, which we eventually did. Um, but I wanted to play bass, but I also wanted play keyboards. I've always kind of done this dual thing where you slap on the bass and you play keys. And that that only can get you so far. So um, Nielsen played piano and I wanted him to play the mini mode bass to cover my bass parts so I could play the Freeman string synth and the mini modes that I had. So um, Oberheim had come out with a partial programmer for their Oberham series. And this would have been, this is probably 75, 76 that I met Dave and I, there's probably, maybe it was 76, October anyway. And so I, I, I went to Dave and I said, can you make something like the programmer that Oberheim has, but that would plug into the mini mode because I want Nielsen to be able to play he doesn't know how to turn the knobs, so I'm going to make a thing that will do presets so he can just play the bass parts quickly. So Dave said, okay, well, yeah, I could probably do that. You know, you draw out the front panel, you know, how you'd like to see it. And we were both mini Moog owners, so mm -hmm. there's not too much, <laughs> you know, three oscillators, envelope generators, and a uh, way to select presets. And so... That was the first uh, collaboration, I guess you could say. So he built the thing. I was so happy just because now I had something to, yeah, we could use on stage, and I could be free of the bass lines, and I could play some other stuff. So that was the first thing. And then uh, I was, I was, I invited Dave to come down to show the sequencer in my hotel room that Norland was paying for, right? Uh, <laughs> and I had stacks of literature on it and i was in the booth for moog and uh, I, there was a norland guy who came by and kind of like what is this uh what's this thing you've got here anyway so dave was off in the room showing off the thing to invites that i would say hey you know go check this out 
So that was 76. Yeah, because in 77, we went, Dave invited me, decided to go to a NAMM show himself. And this one, I believe, was in Atlanta. Yeah. So at that point, he added uh, Barb Fairhurst as president because Dave didn't really want to have to run the business side of things. Just wanted to be an, uh, an engineer. Yeah. And uh, I think Scott Peterson might have been there with us. Anyway, so the th three of us went to this show, and I'd stopped working for Mo. Three of us went to this show with, I think, a emu modular something I'm trying to remember exactly but anyway we had the programmer there we had the sequencer there and uh probably a mini mog and one other thing with it and a lot of the people came up and they saw the programmer and they said why don't you incorporate those two things together into one unit and dave was nah, i don't really want to get into doing that kind of work i just want to be an accessories guy um and so we flew back when we flew back after the show we talked on the way and he said i said so what do you think about it is that possible to to merge those two things he said well know, it's a lot of work and then it's not really practical now yeah. and so that, i think that was june 77 and then um about a month later seems to me maybe july yeah no that's a month later um, he called me and he said, Hey, you know, that thing we were talking about on the airplane, I think, I think I can, I think we can make it happen. I just got a hold of these, the circuit stuff uh, that Dave Rossum was doing with solid state music. And they're making these small integrated circuits or chips, ICs, and it, it seems like it's going to be viable. So he says, why don't you lay out, you know, what you, you do a front panel idea, I'll do a front panel idea, and then come down and and let's chat about it. So, um, I and we, you know, both being mini Moog guys again. So it's like, oh, we're gonna have three oscillators, and uh, some of the things that I knew I was gonna be doing sounds for it. Um, so I was really excited about what could have, what I could have in there, and. Um, I had seen Roger Powell do an art presentation somewhere where he was showing off the Odyssey with a hard sink and sweeping the hard sink. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's a great sound. You got to have that in there. And so I had to show Dave or played him a record or something. I don't remember. I said, this is this is this great sound. You got to have that. But to do that, you need an envelope running the pitch. So to do that, we need a third envelope that's dedicated to do modulation. And then one another LFO that's separate. And then he said, no, no, we can't. That's too much stuff. It'll be too expensive. Uh, so his idea was just to have the two oscillators and the filter and LFO and to make it you know pretty clean. And I said, well, there's got to be a way I can get an envelope to drive the pitch. And I also, the other thing I uh, really liked from my experience with the multi mode and the micro mode was being able to audio rate modulate the cutoff because mm -hmm. you get some nice... Uh, strange things that way so I said and so I want an envelope and I also need a third oscillator that I can use for audio rate and he said no it's two oscillators is gonna be enough so I said well, there's got to be a way you know use the envelope that's there and the second oscillator that's there and how about if we run it through uh, this thing I'll call it polymod polyphonic modulation because it's not monophonic, it's for each voice, so it's got to be polyphonic modulation. I said, okay, well, so yeah, so my my favorite part, my claim to fame or whatever on the Prophet 5 was really the polymod section because that gave me a lot of freedom to to do the kinds of sounds I was hearing in my head. Really, uh, really liked that aspect of it. So anyway, so Dave said about most of the front panel design, you know, was as you see it now, with addition to that section and um, it, he breadboarded the thing in September and it was up and running in December so it was really fast he's really he really did a good job getting that thing going and uh, and Dave Rossum was consulting was helping him do it 
So we had come up with a name and uh, Len Sasso had become, had invested some money. So we sat down, everybody gathered a bunch of names and I, I had, some reason we were talking about this idea of a, a seer or a prophet, a, you know, a mystical feet character or something. And I, I think I said something like seer or, um, I don't know, but I didn't come up. I think Dave probably came up with the name prophet anyway. And he, he wanted to say five voices because one of them was a cost factor. But the other thing was that Oberheim had four, six, or eight. And Dave said, "Well, you got five fingers. Let's just let's do five, and it will stand out." So, uh, in January, he flew down to the Nam show, which was now in Los Angeles, and it wasn't spring; it was winter Nam. And uh, he arrived. He'd been up all night working on the thing, probably two nights. And we were surprised when we opened the booth, so many people gathered around to hear this thing. And uh, like, well, how did you find out? Well, no one said anything about it. So anyway, Dave walks in about midday with the thing under under his arm and uh, pulled into the back room. And I tried to make some presets that it barely held. Uh, the thing didn't tune up very well, I remember. Anyway, so that was the introduction of the Prophet 5. And then... Uh, that of course no one had done a fully programmable so that got a lot of attention and we we took orders for a couple of hundred i think and uh, afterwards everybody we had a big celebratory meeting after the show and dave uh generously gave me i think it was four percent of the company and up to, uh, up to barb's percentage and Men was there. So anyway, we all started off just gung-ho, you know, feeling great about this thing. So that's how I started. But I still wanted to be in this band, and my main focus mm -hmm. was to be a rock god. A rock star and we got <laughs> album coming out. So yeah, we, we got our first album out in 78. So this is, you know, about the time the profit came out. And I didn't really want to work full time, but I was just I had this association and uh ended up right after that we he put you know there was a profit five with a second board in there so it was the 10 voices mm -hmm. but it looked like a, a profit five single manual and uh, i ended up going through doing all the presets on the thing but the tuning was so difficult to, to keep the second board in tune that i think we made six we shipped six uh, of these profit tens in a box and just it was just too much of a nightmare to keep them in tune. Mm -hmm. uh, a guy named uh, Ralph Gleason, no, Pat Gleason, sorry. Pat Gleason in San Francisco ordered, uh, he had a different fur trading company, and he ordered a couple of these. And he was in San Francisco, we were in San Jose, so he, he gave us immediate feedback about the problems of tuning. And uh, the other thing that was interesting, he told me, why are you giving away your sound design, you know, your presets? You shouldn't do that. You should, because he was making money as a consultant, how to, how to run synthesizers. And he, yeah. And that was, uh, you know, I've heard, I've heard that from a few people, uh, you know, uh, of sound designers back in the day, you know, traveling to, um, you know, traveling to different studios and doing presets for people and that sort of thing. And that's, that's, that's far less common these days. Yeah. Well, remember there were there were no presets. Everything you had was drawn out on a little piece of paper. So, uh, and he was it was kind of interesting because I don't know if he felt his. Well, anyway, he was just saying you're crazy to, to do all these things for free, and I'm like, yes, but I get a I get a free synthesizer that <laughs> does presets, you know, and it'll it'll forward our, our band and all that. So anyway, uh, that's how we got started. But I didn't work. Uh, as an employee there until 82. Uh, what, I remember getting the Prophet 10 in, dragging it up to my apartment and doing all the presets for that. And then uh, I know when Dave switched from the uh, uh, solid state music chips to the Curtis chips, I had to come back down and re redo my presets because there were some differences. Uh, but I didn't... Uh, 
so the album came out it didn't sell that well another album came out didn't sell that well so the band broke up and dave called me in 82 i was down in la at that point and he said hey do you want a real job now instead of trying to be a rock star so i said yes okay so then i started as an employee with a sequential full-time in 82. first project was the we had the programmable effects series and uh that didn't sell all that well and uh, then i just ended up anyway doing all of the i was the product specialist there but i was responsible for user interface input and all of the research. well you you did do the the waveforms on the profit vs yeah what was that project like well um the engineer was josh jeffy and he had uh, designed a program on a Windows machine that allowed you to either do the amplitudes of harmonics up to might have been 24 harmonics, but it was like an additive program. Or this this doesn't sound very impressive now, but back then it really was great. You could use the mouse, drag around on an XY grid, and hear it in real time. What the what the thing sounded like, um, and that was great. So, it was my job to put the wave shapes, come up with whatever, however you know, hundred wave shapes. So, I just uh, sat down and done it empirically. What sounded interesting to me? Oh, you know, move the mouse. Yeah, that's that's kind of cool. You know, save that, do it again, and do it again. And then there was, uh, I think, one of them. Josh Jeffy had sampled his voice and and captured a a wave sh shot of that. Mm -hmm. So one of those is his voices, and then uh, three or four of them. Uh, we had a chord keyboard there to study. I don't remember the model, but on the front panel there were little pictures of uh, the harmonics mm -hmm. of certain wave shapes. So I just visually approximated those on my little program oh. <laughs> and they were it was pretty close so I stored a couple of those and then I did a couple of wave shapes I wanted an octave apart or an octave an octave and you know the first fundamental was loud or the third fundamental so an octave and a fifth or two octaves and so I just just put in stuff like that they none of them were really related to each other like you would have later with the PPG stuff you know or the, a, a wave table where there there were changes going across that made sense. These were just all done by uh, by ear. <laughs> yeah, and, and so with that program, you could just kind of create the waveform and then basically yeah. print that to a file, and then that would go right into the system, and then you could exactly. play it out and decide if you enjoyed how how that sounded across the keys or what. Yeah, exactly. And now, was it a long process to go from creating the waveform? to actually being able to play it across the keys or was that fairly fairly quick import no i think it was fairly quick i mean once you once i got the the wave shapes done they put them in the prototype and uh, the hardest stuff with prototypes back then is that you'd work for hours on presets and then the thing would blow up and you'd lose all your work and that that happened a lot <laughs> but um no the wave shapes you know were dead. Was, pretty simple and I think now, we, go ahead uh, well what I was gonna say is so you worked on that um, as far as like user interface on like the studio 440 drum machine um, mm -hmm. and how did working on those older designs influence you working later on your own products because you started developing plugins on the scope platform much later on now did did that previous user interface work influence how you were working with this, the, the digital stuff, you know, the stuff that was on screen? Oh, uh, well, perhaps, um, with the drum machines, I started out as a drummer and, uh, no, we had the lid 9,000 in the, in the studio there. So, if you have any spare 440s just laying around, you can send me one. <laughs> I, I do have one, actually. It's out in my garage right now. <laughs> well, I'm not going to tell you to go look up the prices on those. You should just send it to me. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
but now I ended up, you know, I had I had to provide all the drum patterns with all the things and presets and drum patterns and then the whole sample stuff. It was a lot of work. It was fun though. Um, and all of our trade shows, we I was a fan of fusion music back then, so all of the demos were these crazy tunes that were not it's really kind of insane, actually, now that I look back on <laughs> it. Um, but Josh had this this idea of uh, the name Vector Synthesis. And Dave was over in Hawaii doing an Ironman triathlon, which he, he did a number of somehow amazing. And uh, I think Josh was really feverish. He woke up with this idea of Vector Synthesis. So we called Dave in Hawaii. So what do you think about Profit VS for Vector Synthesis? And he said, oh, yeah, sounds good, you know, so. Uh, and then the idea of that, uh, Chris Meyer was our MIDI specialist uh, engineer, and he he had this idea of mixing these four outputs. So that's where all that came from. I, I just did the the wave shapes, but not a whole lot on the concept, you know. Mm -hmm. But as far as the products I did later, those are and with the scope platform, those were just all done out of uh, frustration from having to hold back. <laughs> all the years when you're doing hardware. So um, after Sequential got bought by Yamaha, we spent a year with Yamaha doing uh, a project, but I don't think they were ever really serious about it because a year after that, we had the head of Korg come through our secret engineering lab and we're all like, oh, what's this guy doing? <laughs> He's a competitor. What's he doing here in our secret lab, you know? Well, it turns out they had already arranged to deal to to let us go and then court Pyrus like a week later and then we started in on what became the wave station i was put in charge of the i was a product manager for the wave station and i had already been working on this thing for yamaha we call it the f8 and i was doing all the screens so the user interface basically you know the nozzle we had but doing all the screens and though those screens then i proceeded to do the wave station screens and the tree logic for that. That was really kind of messy, but uh, all of that came from doing the Profit 3000 interface, which was our first graphics panel that had soft keys. So and I did, I did all of those definitions with soft keys and so on. So everything was kind of derived from that immediately after the Profit 3000 to the FA to the wave station. And uh, after the wave station, we started in on this Oasis keyboard. And that was the first time that I started getting involved with, uh, we had a software program called SynthKit, which allowed to, to build things. And uh, the keyboard, by the time, I see I did a presentation on the Oasis keyboard the first one, not the one that came out, uh, 96, I think, at Frankfurt. And then they decided it was gonna to be too expensive, so they canceled the project. Uh, but we had a custom IC made for that, and they decided, well, you'll make a PCI card, and we'll put it out as the Oasis PCI card. And then I was working on a user interface for that when I saw this Creamware scope project, and that's how I got involved with Scope. I, I, uh, I left Korg, which was a really tough decision, I have to say. I had great friends there, and it was really hard to leave. But I left them to take this job with a company I didn't know anything about. But it was exciting because I wanted to do more stuff uh, on, the, on the synthesizers. When you're this designing was, with This your, was going to Creamware? Or? Yeah, this was going to Creamware. So this is where all the software stuff came in. And I've been working in hardware, you know, uh, interfaces all these years, all that time. And you're in a situation where you have a group of people, you have a committee designing it. And, you know, some people want to take it to the left. Some people want to do it this way. Like the Oasis that we were working on, it had three personalities to it. One mm -hmm. of them was a standalone thing. One of them was a, a controller, like for, you know, you know, DAW type stuff, and the third one had to be, did everything in between. So it was really 
a huge project. So uh, when I got to do the creamer thing, they have a program called Scope. It's kind of like Reactor or any any of the synth builder. You know, it's as my wife called it, a lines and boxes program. So the boxes are these algorithms that have been compiled and written by DSP coders because the scope platform is a DSP card. And at the time, you know, the native code for plugins was not really as high a quality in terms of audio production as you could get using these DSPs. So um, I was excited about that. And the other thing that the scope program had is they had all of the interface tools as well, all the graphic tools. So you could do a really nice front panel, which we didn't have with the core Goasis uh, PCI card. So I kind of jumped ship to do that and uh, spent a year with Creamware and then they had some business problems, couldn't pay people. So then I went on my own in 2000 and started making plugins for that platform. Now I continued, really enjoy working with the scope program and you probably have heard of feature creep from other people. Yeah, oh yeah. So this is the danger with software pr programs. You can, you know, being unleashed after all those years of being held back by committee, you could put in everything you wanted, which is kind of where I went. <laughs> <laughs> you know, making these plugins, and I had about a dozen plugins after a couple of years, with uh, Hans Zimmer being probably my most famous customer, and he really enjoyed the the synths. So um, he sponsored me for a little while there, and I he wanted to, to have he had a Waldorf Wave, and he wanted me to make a version of that to fit into the scope board. So I, I did something, I called it the Quantum Wave. And it's funny now, because I see Waldorf's bringing out the Quantum. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, coincidental. But anyway, I made this thing for Hans, and uh, it didn't sound quite the same, because the uh, Waldorf Waves and the scope system were not interpolated the correct way so as you play down a keyboard they would get duller and you wouldn't have that fizz and that strange uh, aliasing that people associate with with the vs and the wall and the pbg so so that's why i did the plugins and um mostly the design was you know just kind of from the basic left to right oscillator mixers filters approach but you could really well, you go crazy do, you, putting all kinds of things in. You did do the, uh, you were involved on the Minimax as well, right? Only in the sense of I had a Minimoog and they didn't have one to test at the time. So I was giving them readings and recordings of the filters mm -hmm. at different positions with resonance, turning the filter up and down and pointing out some values and uh, checking out phase relationships. Because that, that's still super highly regarded. I mean, considering how old that uh, that emulation is now, mm -hmm. I mean, it's still considered to be one of the best. And that's, you know, it's it's getting pretty up there in age. So that's yeah. that's pretty impressive. So, uh, yeah, then they eventually got, uh, I don't know if they got a Minimo game, but they got uh, a Pro One. Oh, that was the other thing we worked on. So Pro One trying to analyze that because the profit five is obviously derived from that and they they did one of those too so there was the mini max and then there was the prodigy what else did they do? and there was a profit five version now you so you you worked on these plugins and then this translated how into the solaris project the solaris is what you have behind you Yes. So just so that people can kind of get an That's idea of what's one. going There's on with, with all the beautiful screens. Yeah, so um, here's the thing about doing the software plugins. With Scope, with the Scope uh, hardware, there was a limited audience. Mm -hmm. Three, 4,000 users. And once I sold all my plugins, and, you know, there's only so many people buying them, so then I had to keep updating the plugins to make them interesting that you'd, you'd, you'd want to pay for an update, right? And uh, the Solaris started out as uh, a plugin called the Orion, which was my basic 
profit five model. And I kept adding things to it, adding things. And every six months I'd think, oh, well, it'd be nice if we had this and this. So it, it grew so big and decided to give it a different name. And Solaris had already always meant something to me in terms of an emotional context. Uh, I'd seen that movie by Tar Tarkovsky. Tartovsky, China. Uh, it's a Russian uh, science fiction film. And in it, uh, anyway, anyway, I had a personal association with it. It's about loss of a loved one, and I have really identified with the character anyway. So Solaris always meant something to me, and I, uh, so I called the thing Solaris, and um, it turned out to be my best-selling plug-in, and it was an expensive plug-in. It was like 400 bucks. But um, I talked about, well, maybe I should strip it down and make a cheaper version for the people who didn't want to spend that much. And I did make a couple of $50 plugins, and I sold maybe three or four. I mean, nothing. And then all of the bigger, more ambitious plugins, everybody liked those. So I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll go that direction, you know. Uh, when we came to time to do the hardware, death, the way that worked out was uh, a couple of guys at Creamware, once the company folded, we we stayed friends and we said, someday we should work on a keyboard. We should do a project. So time came that they were able to find a government program that helped finance uh, companies, startup companies. Mm -hmm. They needed a customer and that was me. And so I drew up this kind of nebulous performance synthesizer for them to build. And then we started that uh, design in October of 2006. Mm -hmm. And uh, hired a guy from Finland, Antti Hulevainen, to do the code and showed the Solaris in a very, very early, just barely working form in Frankfurt in uh, March of 2007. But now, did, did, I, he, did he have a DSP background in audio? Um, he did. He had published some stuff on, on a number of the audio synth channels uh, of, of Moog filter, and it sounded really good. And I thought, well, this, 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 we couldn't. The guy that had done all the Creamware stuff was working for DigiDesign, so um, he wasn't available. But I thought Antti's work was really good. So he worked on the thing, and then after we showed it, um, we never heard from Monty again, even to huh. this day. But I know he's around. Maybe he'll see this. Hi, Monty. No hard feelings. <laughs> um, so then we we lost about six months and it started all over again. But um, Klaus left DigiDesign to work on the Solaris. So we had Klaus Peel, who was the original Creamware guy, uh, do all the code for the keyboard Solaris. And my only problem with translating from the uh, software version to the hardware version was that with software version, you can have as many knobs and whatever on the front panel that you want. But once you go to hardware, you have to decide, okay, what's, I asked for, give me the, the widest display we could buy at the time, two by 40 characters, and then how many knobs can fit under that comfortably. And there was a, I think it's the human factor was an inch between each knob to give you enough space. So. Mm -hmm. I figured, okay, five knobs per display. I wanted to do this thing where I had different displays because nobody. Which I love, by the way. That was like one of the first things that got me excited about it is I, I hate it when you have virtual knobs, but no way of knowing what they actually are. Um, or then you have to like uh, a lot of people will do like banking and, you know, it doesn't update and, you know, you have to. It, it becomes more archaic. So yeah, one of the one of the things I had seen in all the previous hardware designs, like like you had asked me how that influenced the software, uh, and getting getting back to the Solaris now was, if you added features later, oftentimes you'd see okay, well to get to this version of the filter, hold down these two buttons and turn this, and then. You know, it's a special way to get there because the hardware, once you design a hardware panel, uh, you're committed, you know, and the printing on there, the silk screen, you're committed. So you have to figure out special ways. And what I wanted to do with this Solaris is 
to make it so that it could be flexible enough that we didn't have to do any, um, you know, special codes to get to stuff. So that's why there's endless encoders, and that's why the structure is set up so it's it we can add things to it and not not have to relabel anything basically because the labels the basic labels are there, but you know the knobs are soft labeled so they can change. The um the touchpad at the top you have the the ribbon controller as well. Um, mm -hmm. What was the thinking on coming up with that? Did did you look at things like the CS80 or, you know, what was the inspiration for wanting to have a touch strip on there? We were not going to have a ribbon initially. And um, then one of the hardware guys at Creamware came up with an idea that he had read about, I think from Apple anyway, this resistive strip that he, you figure out a, a way to implement this thing. And so we were going to have a very small ribbon, maybe, you know, that much, maybe five inches or so over. And there's, there's a picture of a prototype somewhere that has it uh, over on the left uh, side there. And he said, I could build this, you know, I got this idea, it would work. I said, oh, great. Well, that would be nice to have too. So let's put that in. And then it didn't work out very well when it became a, when he did it in the prototype, I said, well, yeah, it's not very good. So either we bail on the ribbon idea or maybe there's another way, you know, and I, yeah, I played on the CS80 and I love the ribbon on it as well as the polyphonic aftertouch, which I wish I could do. I wish there would be a keyboard out there that I could, I could buy. Uh, but I found this, uh, this strip, these, uh, they're called soft pots and you can get them in various lengths up to a mm -hmm. thousand millimeters. But we have a 750 millimeter one, and it just had sticky back on it, so you could just stick it down. And, uh, and there you go. Yep, I got one right here because I've been working on a project. Uh, I I decided I wanted a ribbon controller for my Matrix Brute, so <laughs> I had to source this one out myself, and, yeah. I, and I found this. And you just buy them on DigiKey or wherever. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure how I'm gonna do the the positive and negative like you have on there. Um, I, I see how it's like split to two on there. Well, no, it's so there's a there's the soft pot, and then on top of that, there's a, another layer. It's just a, a cover mm -hmm. with a graphic on it, and the yep. graphic graphic is just a graphic. It's not, okay. Fair enough. You know, but uh, but it does produce. We do produce two outputs, so. Two fingers on there will give you two separate ribbon uh, controls. Yeah. So the uh, the Solaris now um, this project is recently getting updated, or what's the deal? Because um, I, I kind of um, I was following just a little bit of the information on it, and uh, I'm just wondering where that project is now, um, and are you continuing to develop on it, and do you continue to work on it, or is it a finished product? Like, what's the deal? Well, remember that fa phrase, feature creep, right? So Exactly. <laughs> I had, when I did the specification for the hardware, of course, I had a long list of stuff. And uh, I kept adding things and changing things, and a couple of years go by, and push comes to shove, we have to get a product out because it's just going on and on Absolutely. Without, any, without any money coming in, right? So they kind of slapped my hand and said, look, we got to stop right now and just get this thing out and we'll get to your, your other stuff later. And, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm not ready yet, you know, and I didn't want to put it out there with all the stuff in it that I wanted I, because all my synthesizer friends will go, oh, you should have put in Yes, yes, I know. I, I have it on the list, you know. Should now, you, you guys included enough excess memory uh, and whatnot so that you could add plenty of things after the fact, right? Yeah, well, that's the, that's the idea. And the problem is you have to pay people to do the engineering. Yep. <laughs> and uh, I don't have a DSP coder now to do new things yet. We have to find somebody. But uh, in, to answer your question, yes. So the code, 
uh, in the machine belongs, I, I've licensed it, but I don't own it. And it belongs to Sonic Core. And uh, for a long time, they were hesitant to let any outside sources work on it. So I went all these years without any updates until last year when we finally made an agreement that I could access the code and have it worked on. And uh, we had one guy offer to work on it up in Canada. And uh, he had it for about nine months and really only did one update to it. And then I had another customer, Solaris owner, uh, who'd been active doing like little modifications on his own software. He was building an editor or something. Jim, and Jim, uh, he said, well, I, I have free time right now, you know, you still need something fixed? And I said, yes, absolutely. So he started in just this last February and uh, man, fast four weeks I had about 80% of the bugs fixed. Unbelievable. And uh, so we finally released our first update in March 15th, you know, what four years after the last update. So uh, it's been really great to get, to see all that stuff fixed. And now we're adding features. When I, I went over to Germany in March to help with the production over there because everything's done in Germany. And then when I came back, Jim had proceeded with the rest of the bugs and he finished those off and started adding features. So it's, it's been a fantastic. Well, that's excellent. Um, no, it's not something that you can make go open source because you don't own the right. the core of it. Um, but luckily, they were kind enough to let you kind of get the ball rolling again. Well, the proprietary stuff is in the DSP code, and Jim is writing uh, the C++ code, which runs the Blackfin. And the Blackfin is the housekeeper. That, it does all of the maintenance and the voice handling and and non not the sound engine stuff itself so there are there are things in the sound engine that i'd like to fix and change and add to we always plan to have a uh, uh phase modulation you know dx7 fm thing we always plan to have uh, a cs80 filter in there and so on so uh we have a line on one guy for dsp coding but haven't gotten that finalized yet yeah, that that would definitely be interesting because it's it it's such a gorgeous synth, and as it stands, as it is right now, I mean, it's still an absolute monster. I mean, Thank it's you. you know, it's it's one of the beast synths out there. And when people bring up uh, digital synths that are out now, because you know, of course, analog is all the rage, but digital is a pretty amazingly powerful beast as well in its own right. Um, that's like still top that comes to mind when when we talk about those yeah yeah i was how, kind how of surprised you, how do you feel about when, when people say oh it's a, it's a vst in a box <laughs> yeah you knew i was going to get to that <laughs> so well a lot of people yeah you because you say well it's just software you know but the hardware as well the first thing is the scope code that klaus wrote that was in 1998 and then by the time he started working on this code, it was 2007. So, you know, about nine, 10 years of experience right there in writing and optimizing code. And uh, he wanted, we wanted it to be optimized to run on these Shark DSPs at, I wanted the high quality sound. I had two, two driving features for me was ease of use, because you got a lot of parameters we had like 1200 parameters in. and it, the ease of use and the sound quality had to be number one and the what i found from my uh scope sales of the plugin of, of the solaris plugin my customers said we'd rather have less polyphony and more features so that's the direction i went and we came to a point uh klaus said well we can either run it at 48k and give you more voices or run it at 96 internally you'll lose polyphony, but the quality of people really good. And I said, yes, let's do that. So uh, the he had to rewrite the algorithm. So they're not the old scope algorithms. It's not simply just uh, porting or, you know, taking those algorithms. Everything was refined. 
done to a more experienced coder at that point, uh, done at higher fidelity, and uh, the power that needed that you need to do that kind of quality was just not available in the native uh, applications with the plugins back then. Now, you know, things are catching up now. Things, computers are faster and faster, and you do have some good plugins. You know, you do have some good VSTs in there uh, coming out now. But for me, this just having all the burden off the computer and done with a special audio chip like the Shark DSP, you're guaranteed, you know, it does that and it does that well, and it's not trying to do any other computer-related things, email and internet and stuff. So to me, uh, when you're using plugins, you still have to balance uh, usage and polyphony against how much power you have, you know. Although I have, I have to say, Urs Heckman has done a, a heck, man, heck of a job with his stuff. It sounds really good. Well punned, sir. <laughs> no, I, absolutely. His uh, some of the things that he's been doing has been um, some of the top of my of my favorites list because uh, you know, with Diva and his new uh, his new Pro One software and all that, that stuff sounds fantastic. Uh, you know, really really nice stuff. Is is the Solaris still your top priority as far as uh, products, or are you working on that along with other things? Uh, wh what is what is your main uh, focus on these days? Yeah. So, well, now that we've ha we finally have access to the code and and third party modification, I want to see it. I want to see it mature to the level that I had initially specified a years ago. So uh, we do have. Well, I'll show you. Like roll back here. So, oh, a couple of years ago, uh, I asked, or we thought about putting the Solaris sound module in a in a simple case. So, we did two of these. And um, I was talking with Axel Hartman about this project, whether we should release it or not. And he said, well, what are the things, what are the main things people like about the Solaris? I said, well, there's sound quality and the user interface. And he said, well, if you do a rack like that, there's no user interface. You're, you're like, what's the point, you know? So we didn't put that out as a product. And, um, I'd kind of have to agree as well. I mean, that's, you know, that, that is one of the, the amazing things about it is like you said, there's like 1200 parameters and yeah. without an easy to access way of doing that. And yeah, you could do a graphical interface, um, on a computer, but that's not quite the same. And even then, then you have to use something like, let's say like an Ableton push or something to that effect that has a screen along with knobs, you know, right there so that you're not, so that you don't lose that completely, you know? Yeah. So no, I, you know, I'd like, to, you know, sure. I'd like to have a spin off at some point, but right now it's, you know, it's enough to get this thing done. And I, I, to be honest, even though I worked with all those hardware companies, uh, I didn't realize how difficult it was to make a hardware piece. <laughs> so, you know, what the difference uh, one millimeter can do on your graphic screens, for example, whether they fit in the metal or not. <laughs> All kinds of things that came up uh, and the availability of parts. You know, a lot, of, a lot of us who are out there just playing with synthesizers, you don't know how much is involved with actually getting the thing done. And I went through five prototypes of, of the case, for example, and each, mm -hmm. each time, it's expensive, like five thousand dollars each time you do a prototype, mm. and uh, you know, always trying to refine it to make it more usable and 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 fit what you want it to do. Um, it's crazy out there, the costs, and you have to order X number of parts to get the price down to a certain point. And then some some companies will say, "Oh, you want, you know, you want uh, so many thousand sharks? You, we can get those in four months." 
So probably my biggest problem is is getting enough parts together and enough money together to build a series of them, and it takes a while to gather all that together. I'm that's the the downside of being a boutique synth maker, uh, being a small you know manufacturer. But um, the good thing is that you have control over everything. You know, it just takes longer to get one. That's all. Have you considered using um, any of that tooling and whatnot, um, any of that know-how to put that kind of stuff into like a MIDI controller space or put um, any of those uh, those products into some of the newer platforms like the Eurorack platform or um, even like a, like a more compact desktop box as opposed to a rack? Yeah, we... There was a, a couple of years ago that I tried to get Sonic Core convinced to let me use the algorithms in a Eurorack format. So we'd have the Solaris oscillators or the filter group or something, and um, didn't even, you know, couldn't agree on that. So that didn't that didn't happen. And now there's so many out there. I don't know. I don't know. I still That's, don't have. Yeah, it, it's it, it's becoming a swamped platform at that yeah. point as well. So so I can understand that as well. But uh, but it's also paper, growing. Yeah, in terms of a desktop, I've I've had people say, "Well, I'll just take the keyboard off and make it a big desktop like that," um, which I'm looking at it now. That would be a pretty good sized desktop. You know, it could everything could be done with one screen instead of six. Uh, and I had a design in the beginning that was just a single screen, but um, I just hate menu diving as much as. Amen. Uh, I <laughs> Amen. To, I hear I you. To try to avoid that, even though there's still paging of stuff in here. It's, it's hard to avoid, but just having the separate left or right groupings and uh, the layout, it just I don't know. I just I like it that way. So. Absolutely. Um, so at this point, uh, you are still moving forward, though. You have uh, a new yeah. DSP guy that you're, you know, kind of working around with and a new uh, new new uh, C++ coder that you're working with. Yeah. And he's he's going. Uh, he told me today, actually, he's because we're, we're adding. I'm back to the feature creep thing. No, actually, I'm trying to get stuff in there that I, I had planned from the beginning and He's adding a couple of things, but he said, you know, really needs, I want to do this and I want to rework the the management of the code. And you know, he's he's really good and he really really wants to take a, a whole overall it's kind of like streamline things down. Um, and eventually we'll have another main board coming out in the future. Uh, so we're gonna update the the main the motherboard or the main board and uh, it's it's got you know next generation sharks on it and uh, more memory and so on but that is going to be backwards compatible so any current Solaris owners can can purchase that and swap it out and put in a new main board and basically have all of that still with the same keyboard box now what would that mainly be doing for you um, in terms of improving the Solaris I mean are you talking about just you know obviously like power consumption and you know uh, cost of, of, of building it it you know could be uh, more efficient using a, a new layout and new board like that but what what's it doing for um, current owners is that are you talking about like being able to introduce features using that that you couldn't have done because you lacked the memory or what uh, yeah possibly yeah that would be one aspect of it um, right now there are six sharks. Well, there, and on the new board, there's six sharks. One of those is, is being held to do the, uh, master effects and the output routing and everything. And the other five are doing the, uh, voice management, the sound engine, let's call it. And we have it so that each of those five produces two voices of polyphony. So we have a 10 voice system. One of the things I'm hoping with the, the newer sharks is maybe three voices per chip. So we could have a 15 voice, for example. Um, other than that, you 
run into this problem called end of life for mm -hmm. parts. Yep, the absolutely. And uh, some of the parts on the older board are getting really hard to find, uh, especially the toss links for some reason, the optical parts. Mm -hmm. I, I would think that, that you could find a pin compatible optical part because people still use optical pins and outs. Yeah, absolutely. We had to buy up a bunch of them from the gray market. <laughs> Crazy thing. So with the newer board, you know, you have updated boards, you have current parts, and you don't run into this struggle to find missing parts and stuff. So that's another reason to do it. But I wanted to make sure that it could be plugged in to all the current Solaris owners, so mm -hmm. they all could benefit. You know? Yeah, that was um, that was one of the things that that you know. That's one of the reasons. Uh, if you see like the Arteria Origin, like you don't see those anymore. From what I understand, a lot of the parts in those you can't get them anymore, so mm -hmm. they can't build anymore, and that's why they stopped updating it. But you know, so that kind of stuff can really put a damper on 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 not just you know not just digital synths too. I mean, that happens to analog synths too. Yeah. You know. I've seen that happen. Um, you know, there, there's that's why when getting back to to the beginning, talking about the twenty six hundred, that's why when you if you want to build that clone of the of the twenty six hundred, you got to buy a rare parts bundle, and it's it's just a few parts, but it'll cost you a pretty penny. Yeah, well, now you see that um, uh, Behringer and uh, Doug Curtis's wife, they're both coming out with. Uh, remakes and actually SSM, SSM is is doing remakes as well. SSM also, yeah. They one of the main guy came to me at NAM and he handed out some spec sheets. He says, "Hey, we're you know talking with Dave Ross and we're going to make these chips again." So yeah, it's, that's really great news. Yeah, and you're seeing some of the boutique guys are are using that stuff now too. Um, the what is it? The thirty three forty chip, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, you're seeing that in the Maleco products and um, I, I know that there's some Eurorack um, modules that are going to have it. And I, I think you're going to, I think you're going to see a resurgence of that sort of product that, that would use those chips and, yeah. and some of the newer ones that are coming out, the, the other reissues as well, which is, which is really cool. Cause like, um, I don't know if you see it. No, probably not behind my matrix brute here. I have a, a Oberheim matrix 1000 mm -hmm. and, you know, that uses, uh, I think they're like 3394s or something like that. Anyway, um, the sound of those things is awesome. And it, it's funny because a lot of that stuff was kind of panned back in the day as far as them saying, oh, well, the oscillators are on a chip and this and that. Man, I love the sound of that thing. I think the filters on it sound awesome. Um, so, but I'm not, you know, I'm not one of those guys to poo-poo something because it's not analog or poo-poo it because it's made this way or that way. Like me, if it sounds good, if it's fun to play, I'm happy, you know? Yeah, probably the funniest thing. So I remember Dave and I, I was in Dave's office and we heard about the DX7 and saw how difficult it was going to be to program just one slider with all these, you know, things. And oh, yeah. Math, and we thought, this thing's never going to go. <laughs> Whoops. lo and behold yeah. <laughs> but you know and that is what's funny about that though is as well as the dx7 sold and as as big of a change as that was mm -hmm. um you know obviously i think that had a lot to do with the, the sound design of it um and you know the the presets that were in it and then the you know the guys who were professional sound designers later who helped program those things and, and get interesting sounds out of it but if you look at uh the market today the dx7 um and fm synths in general kind of have a resurgence because that that 80s synth wave vape wave music is kind of uh becoming popular now and and that's a lot of that stuff is fm based but you're starting to see people come out with more um fm dx7 controllers like navi controllers mm -hmm. to so that you don't have to program with that but of course even with that you still have to deal with the sysx limitations of, of the processor and you know those sorts of things did but you see, did you ever see that huge dx7 programming panel well there's so there was one by yamaha that was like for it but then there's also there's a pseudo remake slash new product that uh mode machines uh brought out to nam and i've seen it i've seen it a couple of times in person and that thing looks awesome it's um it's a it's 
you know, it's like a rack mountable unit, I believe. And it's got, I think, 72 knobs on it. Hmm. There so, was, I forget, it was, there was a company over a long time ago in Germany, and they had a, a huge front panel that had all the knobs on it. I think, I think it might be Mode Machines, and Mode Machines may have bought it or licensed it from that company or something to that effect. Uh, but very, very cool stuff. And like I was saying, I, I mean, that's... It, it, it's weird because you get these these strange circles in synth design where sounds come back around and you know you even mentioned having um you know that style of of phase modulation in the solaris you know which with all the knobs on that thing and and the screens on it i mean it would be a dream to be able to program an fm synth on something like that you know, if that ever came to fruition, that would be a beautiful thing yeah, because but we uh, had it. I had it in the plug-in, and uh, Scope has a. There was a Scope module that was specifically for it, uh, Phase Mod FM, but it's Phase Mod. Um, we just didn't didn't get to finish that part of it, so I'm hoping that we can do that still. And I, you know, I looked at the hardware. You're asking about future spinoffs and stuff. I just. I just think that the interface as it is, it's expensive to build it like this, but um, you know, the Solaris, the internals could be completely replaced, but then, but then the silk screen labels might not mean anything, but I mean, you really could put an entirely new personality in, in that user interface since it's all software. Um, but then you do have the silk screen label, so <laughs> that does commit you to certain things, you know. So the um, I just wanted to. We share. haven't had any answers to have any questions. Have you had any questions? Uh, no, I've I've been kind of in the chat here, and uh, okay. yeah, yeah, I've been, I've been kind of yelling house. Uh, That's it. Thank you. So this is the um, yelling house. Dish. I just wanted to show this because because I was talking about it. So here it is. So this is the the Detronic slash Mode Machines uh, programmer that I was talking about. No, oh, nice. So that, <laughs> that is a lot of knobs, man. Pretty I close you, together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that thing is. Yeah, that's that's something else. Which, in my opinion, having a bunch of scribble strips screens like the Solaris has would be actually easier and better than than something like that, in my opinion. But of course, it would it would cost a lot more too. I mean, you know. Price is always like, a factor, isn't it? It's like I had people ask me recently, um, can you have OLED screens? And I said, well, if, if there's such a one that will fit in the, in the cutout, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are some OLED screens for the 2x40s now. Uh, but they're like five times the cost. Whoa. So, yeah. I mean, if the user wanted to pay more, then I... Uh oh. I think he froze on me. Hold on. So John froze. Um that's 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 one way to kind of end the show. We're getting towards the end of the show anyway. So I'm gonna kind of uh start ending the show and if he pops back in here that you know we can kind of continue from there. Um let me see if I can shoot oh he, he went black. That's interesting. So anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm going to um, send him a quick message. Hold on. Okay. So I just texted him that, that we'll be uh, closing the show out and that he can pop back in here and, and we'll... Uh, close it out oh well i guess he won't be coming back he just lost power in the entire neighborhood um so everything's off there so um hold on one second so again you can go to uh john bowen synth designs uh johnbowen.com and you can check out the solaris there um you can check out 
the uh, you know the forums on there. He's very active. You can also go and purchase there. You'd have to obviously, as he was just talking about, um, you know, building up pre-order stuff so that they can get the chips and everything. Keep in mind, this is a very very small company, and it's all boutique stuff. So. If you want to get a hold of a Solaris, you need to get, you know, basically pre order it and, and go about it that way. I highly recommend if you ever get a chance to play one, check it out. It is a work of beauty and uh, a really impressive synthesizer by a legend in the industry. So definitely worth checking out. Uh, as far as, um, uh, so. And of course, my son is is going crazy up there too. So yeah, it's kind of everything is all coming to a head perfectly for us. So um, I'll just give you uh, a heads up that over at shop.fluxwithit.com, I've got new sample packs that are coming out very very soon. Eight uh, bit dipped will be out uh, shortly, and uh, that is a new sample pack for uh, machine. Ableton Live and pretty much any other drum sampler that you want to throw uh, wave files into, and uh, you know everything is recorded from some pretty interesting sources and then put through some gear and converted all the way down to eight bit eleven kilohertz. So everything has this cool little fizzle to it. Sounds pretty neat. Uh, also, Brutish Drums is on the way, and I have a bunch of other projects that are coming. So please, please support if you like this stuff. Um, and I'm apparently going to. Uh, so there's that. Anyway, if anybody needs anything, hit me up. Peace.